Let's do this. Yep. Perfect. No. Good morning, everybody. We got Jeffrey. We had a <laughs> more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> meeting ahead of us today. Yeah. Um, just for just for perspective, so we start this off on the right foot. About 15 minutes ago, I texted Amy and Heather, and I asked them if we had a team meeting today. So, um, well, really, because they sent the email out Monday saying you're gonna. I know. I was just messing with them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you really? They're later with me. They responded pretty perpetually. It's like we talked about this yesterday. <laughs> that was so neat. Yeah. Um, so anyway, let's start with these uh, good things that have happened. Any bucket filling, anybody in the office that's helped you out, um, that would be great to hear from you guys. So what do we got? A bucket fill you for doing the team meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're here. <laughs> All right, what else is positive or, or anything that's... I wanted to there? share what... Uh, <laughs> You talked about the other day about the yeah. pick I have in my seven. Yeah. Little product. Um, yesterday. Okay, so I'll have more today that I'll send you, but just sort of, I mean, I sort of boys share some stuff to you. Or, yeah. So that's just, um, that's coming. The villas that are very high end. Two blocks to Six Smith Beach. All oh, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> On the white side. Yeah. So it's going to be called the Boulevard uh, uh, Villas at uh, White Side of Minnesota. Cool. So that's a perfect example of the networking. One thing we're going to talk about in the second half of this meeting today is just the connections that you make. Why do we make these connections at the office? And is there a benefit to our clients for doing so? You know, and with that said, I would like to bucket fill Mr. Nagel because we're putting a deal together right now, free market. That is really beneficial for both of our clients, and we'll talk more about that later. But thank you for being a, a good professional so far. So, yeah, so you far. Are. I don't mean like that's going to change. <laughs> <laughs> is this a higher degree of accountability when you're amidst your peers in the office, right? So, all right, what else is good and positive? I can fill both uh, Ben and Alex and Scott's bucket for letting me host open house um, last week. I'm trying to do more open houses and like try to do one lower end and then one higher end. So I get to have conversations with a lot of different types of people. Um, and so yeah, I've been just cranking them out. So that's good. Thank you. Thank so you. Good. Thank you for hosting them. I have one. I uh, kind of like what you were saying about connecting agents in the office, Ryan and I are working on this project and have some questions for him back here. And he was Mr. very Homer. <laughs> he was very helpful and we appreciate that. Okay. He's usually not very nice, but he was that day. <laughs> so Jeffrey, how long have you been in this business? Thirty seven years. Just you're at thirty seven years. Thirty seven years. Thirty seven years. Tap into so thank you for that. What else? Something positive. How about another positive? This is great connections. I love that. Anything positive that's happened in your business? Something exciting? I mean, the market is uh, constantly moving and shifting. We got. Well, I'd like to thank Courtney and Jacob. They've been working super hard. We've got four listings active Friday and one coming soon Friday. So they're running all over the place. Well, so thank you guys. Remember the years it took to convince you guys to hire someone? Oh, it's like, oh, oh, a little slow. A little I'm telling them, hire someone, hire someone. Was that a good choice? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Very helpful. Should have done it. We started talking about it before we started talking about it. I know. It is. I said <laughs> part, that's part of actually the book as we move into this. You know, um, think, think 80 million. It's the next section that we're going to do, but all right, let's move on to the next part of the team meeting. What do we got? The calendar. I don't even know where we are. Uh, <laughs> Mega camp. So there's obviously stuff going on in Mega camp right now. If you guys watch any of the videos, Gary's they're posting stuff about Mega camp, which is kind of cool. 
So if you're sitting around twiddling your thumbs and you want to hear some inspirational, you can listen to some of that stuff. And then we expect when, when you know, Kevin and Kami and not Jelena was there, but um, she's here. Uh, who Derek. Is there? Derek, you know, when they come back, Angie, yeah, the Angie Toomey, um, very responsible ALC members are there for you, which is good. So they'll come back and tell us some stuff. Um, the other thing we have is this R and R happy hour. Jeffrey, it's at uh, the Irish place of uh, McCormick's today. Um, that's always fun. You guys are very, very different than business. You know, I'm being in business because we actually can talk clients, obviously, but we talk a little bit about how things are going. We get to know each other a little bit better. It really is a good experience. And um, I think the last two times it's been myself and again, seven to ten ladies. So I wouldn't mind if there were some other people that showed up. Definitely doesn't bother me. Well, Wednesdays are tough for me only because it's my golf day. Oh, of, of course, course it is. Really fine, but I only got one left after. So, <laughs> there you go. And I'll be back. Yeah. 37, 37 years in the business, you can play golf every Wednesday, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, that works out good. All right, what else we got on the calendar coming up just this week? Yeah, this is um, tomorrow or Thursday. Yeah, that's tomorrow at the Dyna Market Center. They're no, it's here. It's here. Here, here, here. Oh, it is? Yep. Yeah, they're having, <laughs> people are going to be back tonight and tomorrow that are talking about Mega Camp tomorrow. Yeah. It's either here and on Zoom. Yeah, okay. sorry. Yep. So tomorrow. Okay. Oh yeah, Derek's not here to talk about this, but they are doing a, a wealth a committee meeting from one to four, and they have a speaker coming. Mm -hmm. um, and Derek <laughs> and um, that agent from Minneapolis Lakes, who are uh, leading the wealth committee, are are in charge of that and planning that. So it should be really good info. That's also here. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And only in person. Uh, yes, I believe so. Good next. This is where we are. We're on week two. Murray, okay, and thank goodness you told me the right pages because I read yes. it all yesterday. Um, okay. So anybody else, raise your hand if you did read this, just so we have perspective, okay? So the smartest ladies in the room. But that's good. Um, okay, so this this section is called Think a Million, and it starts out with building a 20-lane highway for your future. So the premise is... Do you start your business and start small and build your way up? Or do you start thinking big and build according to that initial thought of thinking big, right? And, and Gary's perception on how to do business is to think big first. Um, work to learn, the next part of it is work to learn versus work to earn. So how many of you have been in a position where you are scrambling just to put a deal together because you need the money to make things happen. Raise your hand if that's ever happened. I mean, it's happened to me even today, it still does. Or you're scrambling because you're a little bit behind and you're trying to put a deal together, okay? I'm gonna ask you a question. What are the potential risks of doing business that way? Remember the last time you did that? What are the problems that can come up if you choose that you're gonna work to earn before you choose to work to learn? Trying to shoehorn someone into something that might not fit. There you go. We're the salespeople pushing a client into something that may not fit because we want it to work. And who are we? Who, who does that benefit the most? Scott, yes, and not the client, right? That's one. What else? What else can happen? So you work to earn to make money. You do a transaction. You don't know everything. You do it quickly, you get it done, it closes. Nothing goes very smoothly because you kind of push through it. And obviously you didn't know everything that you were doing before you went through the transaction. What's the probability that that's gonna earn you future business from a source of referral from that client? Oh, very low, right? And where does the majority of our business come from in, in real estate, especially at Keller Williams here? Referrals. Right, past clients and referrals to new business from past clients, right? Um, so that goes hand in hand with learning first before you earn. It is a super hard concept to, to say, I'm gonna commit to this because you've gotta be able to make money. However, if you don't commit to the learning part of the process, by the time you get to the earning, it could all just fall apart like a house of cards, right? Understand the risk that's there. 
you know, so it's taking time to learn first before you earn. So that was the first one. Let's see what else we got here. Have you ever thought about how many years medical students must work as interns and residents before being allowed to practice their trade independently? Besides laboring through four years of undergraduate studies in another four of medical school, doctors must typically practice as an intern for a year and serve a minimum of two years as a resident. It's a staggering to think about, but the work learn, work to learn process for the average surgeon can take as long as 12 years. Medical students invest a lot of money and time before they work to earn. Okay, so let's talk about that for just a minute. How much does the average heart surgeon make per year? Do we know? I have no idea. Right. 450 to 550,000 a year. Okay, pretty good. Not bad, right? How much does the average luxury real estate agent make per year? 450 to $550,000 per year. So take a doctor at $300,000 a year and a realtor that's been in the business for 10 years making $300,000 a year. I think we should be just about as serious about our learning in this job because of the money that we're earning as a doctor. And I know it's a stretch, but this is a high earning business if you do this business successfully. So it's something that's, if you're thinking big from the beginning, you want to make a half a million dollars a year, maybe you want to make $200,000 a year, whatever that thinking big is to you, you got to make sure we're taking it as serious as other people that are earning that amount of money. Does that make sense? That's why I like this little correlation. They did, he didn't correlate realtors with the, with the doctors, but he said, look at all this work that they put in in order to be proficient at their job, you know? Now, are we saving lives on a daily basis like a, like a heart surgeon is? No. Are we changing lives? Do you think that's one of the reasons we're still paid the amount that we're paid to do this job? So, is there anybody in this room that thinks realtors are paid too little? There's something to be considered. You know, it's about being responsible and taking it seriously. Now, you can make more, which is great. All right. Um, Yeah. <laughs> Very aggressive people like myself, this is a mistake I would make. Um, think that this is a waste of good selling or listening time, but the fact of the matter is ready, aim, fire always wins out in the long run over ready, fire, and aim. Okay, so I just thought that was a little good one to say, you know what, this is supposed to be done in order. So again, don't just jump right through the hoops and, and try to get the deal done. Okay, so there are nine ways that the millionaire real estate agent thinks. And the first way is I put them up here, okay? So these are the foundational ones and I'll get you guys involved so this isn't boring, okay? And these are support. Okay, the foundational ones. The first one is the big why, okay? And one of the things, ladies who read this, do you remember when they told the story about his friend, Gary's friend? Gary's friend says, Gary's friend says, yeah, um, why do you always keep working? You know, and, and Gary says, well, why do you stop working? He said, why do you need so much money? You know, he, he said, I don't said, work for money. He yeah. said, yes, you do. Why do you keep doing all this? Right? And it wasn't about the money. And what was the difference between the way that Gary runs his business and that gentleman, the way that he talked about his friend and how his friend stops working when he makes the goal of the money that he's made. So if he wants to make 250000 he makes 250000 then he goes out and golfs with Jeff for the next <laughs> three months at the end of the year. Okay? So Gary proved to him right there that their mindsets are dramatically different. The gentleman who stops at 200000 is working for the money. Once he got to the goal of the money, he stopped, and he does it every single year. The alternative mindset, which is the one that we try to promote here as much as possible, is that we're thinking about this first. We're thinking about why we're working. And unfortunately, if it's just the money, that will not work. That will fail. It has failed for so many people over and over and over. Um, and so the book promotes thinking about what your big why is. 
you know, why are you doing this? What are some of the benefits? And that's what I want to ask the group collectively, because I want to ask you to participate a little bit, because we all have reasons. And if you're willing to open up a little bit and share, why do you do this? I mean, what, what is the greatest benefit? Is it something that benefits your family, your lifestyle? I mean, what is it? There's no judgment here. You know, if you say I like money and I put money in my mattress and I sleep on it, that's fine. That's what your goal is. But I have a feeling that we're going to have some alternative goals that will be helpful to share. So who's up? I do 37 years, 35 of them have been new construction. Why? And I do it because I love to see people build and move into a bed. It is very, very satisfying. And it creates, for the reason I do it, it creates listings for me, right? So I do, I create my own market, and that's really thrilling for me to create a neighborhood, sell all the homes, and then I usually get the backup homes. So three to five years later, I'm reselling them something else, you know? So it's just very, so, um, the money's nice, but it's very fulfilling to, to, to I see mean, the neighborhood come together, have all my clients in there, and then be the expert in that area. You know? awesome. And the cool thing about the backup house is you're helping them with that transition, getting out of the old into the new that you're so excited about. You know, they're custom doing and choosing everything and building their house just the way they want. So that's very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, I can share. Please. I've uh, I've actually struggled with this question for from my since you started. Yeah, since I started. Um, it's only because a lot of people use their Y as like my family, like my kids, my X Y Z or whatever. Uh, I don't have kids. I don't have a significant other. I yeah. So like I can't use those reasons. That's my why. And it was probably the beginning of impact. Uh, probably 90 days ago or 60 days ago or however what it was, it was like, I need to realize that now I haven't figured out what my big why is, but I need, I finally like was hit by the wall that my future isn't just me. So that's, I mean, for right now, my why is my future. That is more than just me. Kind of our team's big goal and it's kind of, changed over the years, but the big focus is just making a real estate transaction easier and better for everyone. Just because so many people you talk to about how horrible or how they feel cheated or whatever happened in the real estate experience. So just making it easier, better, more fun for everyone kind of thing is our focus on everything we do. That's cool. That's service oriented, right? Service that you're providing to the clients, you know, and if you collectively as a team do that, that's, you know, and you can see that in lots of different industries that if you are service oriented, you could be extraordinary at it and it really, it makes for a better experience for people. So that's good. All right, All right one more. Yes. Uh, helping like my friends and family, like first bought my house and Ryan is my realtor, but. Yeah. Pretty good one. Um, good connections, like in going to my friends and family's house and when they have other people over and that's letting the their friends know that I was their realtor helping them buy the house and just kind of seeing all of them happy and starting their lives. That's pretty cool. It sounds like you brought value to their lives, you know, as a professional in, the, in their life, big transition. So that's great. Obviously, everybody wants to feel valuable, and that's a great way to do it. This is a good business for that. So very good. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. As we proceed, a couple more minutes in this book. Oh, I like this, Mark. Okay. How many of you have worked really hard the day before vacation? Raise your hand. <laughs> I want you to think about the last time you went on vacation and the day before you left, when you were telling your business partner, your assistant, your husband, wife, whoever's going to help you when you're gone, and not to be all gone at the same time, but whoever's going to help you when you're gone, you know, think about that day. And then tell me if that was one of the most productive work days you had the entire year. Because I would be willing to bet a hundred bucks against everyone in this room that that was the most productive work day that they had this entire year. 
Why is that? Focus. Because what was the big why that you were busting your butt to get everything done significantly more efficiently, faster, better than you do it on a daily basis? You're going on vacation. I think Homer's is going to sit around and twiddle his thumbs today knowing he's golfing for four hours this afternoon. Oh, he's going to get it done. Now think about a vacation and think about how you know, significant that is to you. You're about to go to Hawaii with your family. You're about to go to the Bounty Waters. You're about to go do something really fun and exciting. That is part of your bigger big why, right? It's your life. It's your family. It's your, your lifestyle that you're going to do. Think about how productive we are. And it's only because we are uber focused on, on the fact at that moment is that we are focused on our big why at that moment. We're focused on exactly what's coming next and how, what it's going to take to get us there. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Gary says work that way every day, according to your big, I'm burning yourself out. But consider the fact that you can be significantly more effective and efficient. And he talks about, yeah, you're not over hanging out, having coffee and chit-chatting with someone the day before you leave on vacation. So there's certain things that you cut out because you're focused on the big why. I thought that was pretty cool. All right. Um, there's some really fun perspectives in here. This, this, the, you know, I like this part because it's so much mindset, you know, so I really did like these chapters because it's mindset. Um, so this is something else that stood out to me, Gary and his friend. And Gary says, when I wake up in the morning, my big goal is to, the very, to do the very best, to be my very best, and to grow as much as possible. And I've made money simply as a byproduct to that constant pursuit of personal growth. Okay? So we have a motto on, on our team that is do what you're doing when you're doing it extraordinarily well. Think about that for a second. Do what you're doing when you're doing it extraordinarily well. So when you're in the moment and you're with a friend at lunch, be very, very good at being with that friend at lunch. When you're focused on preparing for a listing appointment, and that's what you're supposed to be do, doing at that moment, do that very, very well at that moment. That's what's going to help you on a day-to-day -day basis develop personal growth. Because you're constantly thinking, like Gary did, I wake up in the morning and I do my very, very best to be my best and to grow as much as possible. What else does that tell you? I've been in this business for 25 years. Jeff's been in it for 37 years. Scott, how long have you been in this? 19 years. Have you stopped learning? Do you want to, on a daily basis, continue to learn? Yes, you do. Find me? Yes. <laughs> I didn't ask, do you learn? Because we know that that's... But um, do you want to learn? Yes. Do you, do you, are you eager to continue to learn, right? Which means we will... And this, you guys have got to be a little careful with this from a psychology standpoint, but I want to just work through this really quick. You have to accept that you're not good enough. You have to. Because you won't want to continue to develop for, as a person if you're good enough. If you're going to stop, Gary's never stopped. He has not stopped yet. He's at mega camp right now. The guy's like 95 and he's still going, right? I mean, he's still going. He's still learning. He's still saying, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. I'm not good enough because he cares about his clients and he cares about continuing to learn. Make sense? It's our responsibility. That's, our, that's, that's one of our goals. Okay? Cool. Almost done with the book. Okay, this one's pretty cool. Um, so this chart is the next piece of the puzzle. You got production and you got time. And these are in millions. So if you set your goal in the beginning, when you start thinking about how you're going to develop your business, if you set your goal at 2.5 million in sales, okay, you have to consider the time it takes and the energy and the learning it takes to get to that goal, right? You set your goal at 5 million, you have to consider the time 
in, and, and energy and learning that it takes to get to that production level. 10 million, 20 million. And Gary is saying, start here and start here. Because if you don't start there, you won't take into consideration what it takes to get here and to get here. Because if you start here and you set your mind here, then all you're going to have to do is what's in this box. So it's about thinking big first, right? It's about starting big first. Does that make sense? It's kind of like the one thing book where it starts at the very, very end of your goal and you work yourself backwards. Instead of getting to one thing, we're just creating this realization that in order for us to do this, what's it going to look like within this giant box? What do I have to do to earn this? And you will start, as we talked about in the beginning of the chapter, you will start setting up the learning and the education that it's going to take to get there. If you don't think like this, you will not consider what you have to do behavior-wise to get here. But if you think this way first, then you're going to set the stage and do these stepping stones that are going to get you there. It's going to get you there a lot faster than starting this way and then stopping when you get there because you met your goal. It's about creating scalable models. It so is. if you set models and habits for your business that are too small, it's the equivalent of buying like a two-line phone system. Yep. But you someday you want to grow. Well, that means you have to scrap the whole thing. Buy one that has a capability to go as big as you want to. And only use two lines right now, right? You have to think, what is the scale? What's the end goal? And then uh, how do I build models that will create the habits that continue to function when we get there? Very good. Okay, let's just say the guy, these guys didn't make a grave mistake when they started in the business and they did it differently. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. <laughs> this is where these two guys, and you know why I put a C on there. Can I spell your name? Okay. For, I put, years. for years. I put a C on the end, and it spells R I C K, so I just make sure you guys. <laughs> That's what it's been. It's been for years. I love it. Word, my, my name there. Um, <laughs> they give me a hard time for spelling their name wrong. I spell it correctly here. Right? <laughs> so this is where they start. This is where they come in. They're like, oh, yeah, we want to do five million a year. Maybe even 10 million a year, right? So they start and they're like, it's the two of us. Yeah, go, go. You know, we can marry each other and we can do great. Well, then they stop here because they got here and it's like, ah, it's a couple of years of watch film. This is using as an example, if you don't mind. It's not completely accurate, but this is for example. <laughs> so they stop, pause. They don't, they didn't stop working. They just kept working, but they were limited <clears throat> by where they were here. And then they're like, oh, man, what about getting up there? Yeah, you guys, go up here, go up here. You know, everyone's telling them, go up here. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. So they hired not just one person. They hired, like, well, one, then two more. You know, so they decided, we want to look at this. What does this look like? And in order to do that, what did you have to do? You had to change your business model. You had to hire other people, right, to say, oh, now, look at, I mean, look at the production that they're bringing to the table as a result of the work that they're doing. Isn't it extraordinary? Yeah. And I think an important part to keep in mind is like in the nine to 12 months after it, that's when you see the exponential growth. Like it takes literally every single person has been nine to 12 months and you exponentially go up and then you hit that next one until you just keep adding it. Pretty impressive. And, and it just comes back to the, philo the philosophy of actions get results. And it's, it's in any element of the business, even just in the sales side of meeting someone at an open house, you might not have action or get the results for two years when they call you up. It's the same Everything thing is still laying people on, but just trust in the system and it works. So let me ask you this, because I've been trying to not poach, but use some of the stuff that you guys use from a marketing standpoint and from a, from a client retention standpoint, because you have put into play a lot of stuff now that you got a full team together. Um, in my opinion, all of that is encompassed in this much larger box but it was just the two of you. I don't remember you guys doing the events that you're doing, the follow-up you're doing, this additional creative marketing that you guys do consistently, right? So you're taking the mindset of what does it, what's it going to take to stay up here? What's it going to take to get up here? And it's taking all those steps in order to get to that because you're thinking big, right? And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to think big. Okay? We have an agreement. We'll try that. Think big. 
All right, what's the next category with the desserts as the guest speakers today? <laughs> you don't know that. It's not as very good that you're here. Did you by chance put the notes I sent you on here somewhere? Didn't, but I can get it. I gotta find them. <laughs> Hey, Rick, I just want you to know you're doing great. Who is that? Oh, Katie. Katie. <laughs> you. She must be on. Is that pre recorded? Just hit play. Yeah. De <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> when you need yeah, it. Every day. No, uh, doing great. great. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. What did I do yesterday? Yes. It's in our group text. Um, why don't you guys come up here? Let's talk. Wait, here we go. So the next part of this, which I think is really fun, you guys. I don't know All right. So I'll pretend I'm the host. These guys are speakers. So a lot of companies. Other companies, you know, real estate companies are very, agents are very, very protective about their clients and about their business because they don't want anyone else to take their clients away, right? Um, seems like the mindset of Keller Williams is a little bit different in the sense that um, we share a lot. It's not like you tell me who all your clients are and I can call them and introduce myself, right? Right. But, you're um, to. but, but, <laughs> but we do share information. Talk to us a little bit about why you think, because I think you guys do it a lot. You know, why do you think it's beneficial? Because our job is to do the best for our clients, right? Why is it beneficial to your clients to sell an off-market listing to someone else in the office or buy an off-market listing? I think the first thing, like you said, is that it's best that we're doing what's in the best interest of our client, right? Um, whether that is going on the public market or not, but we found many times that doing it off market is actually a big relief to the seller, depending on what their situation is. If they're going through a divorce, if it's a hoarder's house and they need it gone, maybe they need money very quickly and they're okay with maybe not going onto the public market and have a cash buyer, or that it's a complicated transaction that maybe the sellers are doing a big remodel and they'd rather sell it before the remodel is complete. There's all sorts of different factors that can be in the best interest of the or on the other side, where if there's a buyer that's from the office here who's willing to pay a premium to have something off market, that can also be a win-win just because we are in an improving market when there is somebody who's willing to pay something that is a win-win agreement and a win-win price that could be worth it. That's good. So that prompts me to think of the following. Let's just say you got, you know, you're about to list uh, 500. Well, let's do it the other way because it actually went this way in one of our transactions. I don't remember the numbers, but I'll just throw it out there to make it easy. I'm about to list a $500,000 house, right? And I have the opportunity to put it on the market, potentially obtain multiple offers. Okay, so we get four or five multiple offers. And, and the highest price on the market, if we were to put it on market, multiples is 520. Okay, so we take that no inspection appraisal gap coverage. Okay. Um, briefly, what percentage of buyers get nervous when they buy a house? 100. That was easy for realtors. Easy answer. Some, pe some people just pause that. Okay, that's the first piece to remember, 100%. Now, <clears throat> how nervous do you think a buyer is in a multiple offer situation when they come to the realization that they outbid four other people, they didn't do an inspection, they're taking all their extra money for appraisal gap coverage if the appraisal comes in low. Now, let's imagine at that 520 price, the appraisal comes in at 510. Great, we got appraisal gap coverage, right? What's the probability of that super overly anxious buyer who just came to the realization this may not be the best investment for us? What's the chance of them saying, we're out, we're going to give up our $5,000 worth of earnest, we're running? It's high. So even with all those pieces put together, it's really important to realize that multiple offer situations are not at the absolute best all the time. There's a lot of situations in which things can fall apart. Carry that over now to... Your buyer comes in, I say I'm going to list it at 500, and you guys tell me what. You'll give us 515, right? Mm -hmm. But we want to do an inspection, right? Okay. Uh, okay, as long as I don't put it on the MLS, inspection is not a bad thing. Maybe we learn more about the house. 
before we put it on. We know there's going to be any big problems if it has to go on. So that's not bad. Okay. So yeah, we'll do the inspection. No problem. Right. Who's the buyer's agent? Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever raised your hand? Have you ever heard the theory that good realtors attract good clients? If you have not heard that, burn it into your brain. Because if you're a crappy realtor, you will not have good clients. It is only logical. People who are not good buyers and not good sellers, they're not hiring very good realtors. They're going and hiring people who just do it part time and are not very good at it, right? They're friends, you know, that sort of deal. So what I can count on now is I know these guys, I know them enough to know that they're good realtors. The probability of their buyer coming through on a transaction is extremely high. That makes sense? So now, as I go through this process, I'm thinking from a selling side, it's getting better and better and better. I'm like, we're getting above list price. You don't have to go through the whole marketing process where you're living in a glass house and I ask you to get out, you know, every, you know, two hours, every, you know, twice a day, right, for showings and everything else that's going on. Um, I know the buyer's realtors. The other thing is, how many times does conflict arise in a real estate transaction, generally speaking? Like what percentage of real estate transactions will have some conflict? We always say, probably something, right? Who do you want to be dealing with? Joe Smith at <laughs> our realty, who you've never heard of, or the deserved twins who you can trust that you're going to be able to work on. Now, something else, <laughs> a side effect that I didn't realize, that we're in this together collectively, right? The last thing you probably want to do is burn bridges with people that you respect, that you work with, and, and that, you, you know, that you're going to be working with over time. Now, I'm going to tell you, from experience with other companies, not a problem in other companies for people to burn bridges with the other agents in the office because they don't want to do collective business with them anyway because they're going to afraid that they're going to take their clients, right? It's a whole different story here. So there's a collaboration that can be really, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. That is so wildly true across the whole industry. It's, like it's such a small world. Like, yeah, there's a million realtors out there, but like 80% of them are doing like, or 20% of realtors are doing like 80% of the work. So it's not a real thing, but like you get the point of that so real how often like you see somebody and you're writing multiple offers on somebody who you know it's just good to keep all relationships makes a big difference yeah and then it's a win-win for everybody here because we, we can put everything together if something happens afterwards you know we say to ourselves yeah we no longer have any fiduciary duty to buy wipe our hands clean wipe the dust off your feet and leave you know and hope that everything goes fine but if something does come up in the future well then you're here you know we've talked about things on different houses because you know, and, and, and Brahma's incredible at stepping up to the plate, especially in, in other agencies' office that we've done multiple deals with that are responsible. Market. Exactly. Yeah, just to be responsible. Yeah, and, I mean, just doing the right thing. Like, when a house needs something, he didn't know about it. We're like, it's like over disclosure kind of thing. And like, doing the right thing. Well, if the house needs a repair, let's get it done kind of thing. Let's have the right person do the repair. I mean, we were through one that had a $10,000 rate on mitigation. It was one of the 10. It was 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. Exactly. And work through that. So. Randy Wiestrand with Radon Removal Incorporated has installed more systems in the state of Minnesota than any other contractor in Minnesota ever. So he's the top guy, right? He's been around for a very, very long time. It's Radon Removal Incorporated forever. That was the most expensive system he's ever installed. So he looked uh, back at his records and like, I got to eight, you know, <laughs> but I didn't get to 12. So. Yeah, that's what happens when you're buying a six-level house with multiple foundations and all kinds of complications. But imagine going through that process with another agent from a different company that you don't really know. I mean, just the, just the, the issues that can potentially come up with that. So it's an encouragement for collaboration, right? And I can tell you just personally, Scott and I are doing a deal right now. I've never worked directly with Scott, but I am now, as of early yesterday, you know, working together to put a deal together for two different parties. And it becomes one of those things where I feel way more responsible because I respect the gentleman. You know, he's in our office. I'm going to see him every day throughout this whole transaction and after. We've done, the deals we've done have been not easy, you know, so, and we still respect each other in iron sharpens iron, which is the expectation of Scott as well. So it's a good, good thing to, to, to bring up.
making use of the document that Lydia sends out all the time for the withhold and buyer mm -hmm. needs. I mean, we can connect so many properties and buyers together. I mean, we all probably have tons of properties and buyers kind of thing. Just, just, there's there's a, a, a tab for listings and a tab for buyers. So put all your needs and wants and everything in there. It's super, super helpful and can help the people who aren't in the office. Yeah, I don't even know what property Nagel's got. I probably have, we had a buyer for it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting it from that list. <laughs> and the other thing is, of course, just being in the office and not being a secret agent by sharing, even in person, what your needs are. There's so many That's transactions. How all of our office, like literally us stopping by people's office, people stopping by ours, and being like, what do you got? What can I sell? Let's do it. Kind of thing. I literally walk into their office at least once a week. And talk to them. Yeah. It works. Yeah, it works. It works. It's, you know, it's really, really nice. So let's shift gears a little bit. Do you guys have any questions about that? Does anybody have any aversion or objections to that that idea of collaboration? I'd love to hear the devil's advocate. I'm call you the devil, but I'd love to hear you know some counter uh, intuitive perspective. I don't have a counter perspective, but I do know that other offices really tout this. So I've heard about other offices saying, "Oh, we have this huge off-market network that we can." And they really use that to, to, with their sellers, especially, to say, hey, we might be able to benefit you. And so it's one of those things that I think you can say as well. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Depending upon the client and the client's needs, it might be best to do. I've got multiple clients who do not want it. So we've got those listings too. They do not want it. Else? Okay. Networking, gentlemen. So this is the second piece of it. Okay, so we've got the collaboration with, within our office, which is great. And now, what about networking? What about, tell us a little bit, if you guys would share with us. Um, who is in your network? These are people that you intentionally and purposely connect with from a business standpoint. So who is in it? And then I want you to explain to us why. Right. So I mean, don't name every person. Right. Here's Unless you guys want to take the notes. No, I mean, I think the biggest thing is pouring into the people that you like and trust and want to do business with and okay. taking care of, spending time with them. Um, Helping them. Loving on them. Exactly. Yeah. Helping Making them positive grow. experiences that want encourages them to want to spend time with you, vice versa kind of thing. And kind of being the connector of all the different groups that you're in. So really, I mean, from when we meet a person, whether it's we do business with them or not, you're letting them know, if you need anyone great, anyone in any industry, let us know. We've got a resource for life. Great, great, great. So that they feel as though they can reach out for anything, anytime. So that we stay top of mind, not for just real estate, but naturally, of course, it is real estate. So like um, yesterday, somebody reached out saying, hey, I need a PDA pediatrician, pediatrician. at OGYN. We're like, we're on. Yeah, so we talked exactly. to our friends who are in the industry, and they gave us awesome recommendations, so we get to them. So now we're helping their parents move from out of state to Minnesota, and it's just like, be the resource, be the person that they lean into. Um, but to answer your question a little better, um, is like joining a group or a circle that that you can take care of and they can take care of you in terms of helping support each other. Like give us an example. And so, of like right. and, 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 and so I'm in this networking group that we meet every single Thursday. Um, there's about 30 or 35 of us and everyone is a business owner and there's a single person that is in the industry. It's like a BNR group, but it's yeah, like a chamber group or something of that. Exactly. So join anything like that. And talk about give back to the community because that's that. volunteer. Again, it falls back into connecting people. And so when someone reaches out for something, you have someone that you know, like, and trust okay. that is also going to keep you in touch with that client too, right? So, so it's a web. So I want to challenge you and to go in a little bit of a different direction um, with this next question. And that is, um, tell us a little bit about your more intrinsic and natural networks that you have. Because the, the, the network group, is that was purposely to network, I joined that group. So tell us a little bit more about who you are communicating with on a daily basis that eventually are people that you're doing business with and they're, they're doing business with you. Yeah. You know, like, 
what type of groups right. are these? And, and you know, because obviously there's a reason. You, first of all, you heard them say people, I guess I would say like-minded, you know, things that do, that they do things like you do, that you like to do. You've got common interests in mind, right? That sort of stuff. So share a couple of those. And, and so again, what you focus on expands. So if you can pick to door knock a $2 million house, why wouldn't you do that over a $200,000 house? Kind of the same idea for maybe if you want to grow your circle, choose who that group is that you want to hang out with, right? Reach out to them, become their friend, go out to lunch with them, go out to happy hour with them. They're going to bring their friend. So it's the same thing. What you focus on expands. You get to pick what that is you focus on. So yes, if that circle is um, like athletes, if it is celebrity type people, if it is influencers, if it is something of power um, that can help the, or doctors, nurses, surgeons, things like that, that help you get connected to different price points. If it's your neighbors that you want to and you want to specialize in that neighborhood, that's awesome as well. So just whatever you focus well, on, be intentional about it. Okay. Can you guys in the room share a little bit, uh, some insight into what some of your network groups are that are natural, not ones that you intentionally selected as a, you know, because you wanted to get new business? Talk to me about the ones that you are focusing on because they exist in your life and in, in your, uh, uh, you know, your, your daily life and experiences and stuff. Go ahead. So I'm on the fire department where I live, and okay. that has been a really good source for me. It's networking and the community that I live in. As why? Well as why is it a good source of networking and community? Because we're going to ask that why. Why is that a good source? Uh, because we're naturally there anyway. And so you're together already. Yep, we have a lot of common outlook on, you know, why helping people, things like that. And then, you know, I mean, it's it's gone over to other fire departments in the area where it's just, we're all kind of... Uh, Can I ask you a question? Fire, fire um, professional firefighters generally trust each other? How about a natural opportunity to be in a network in which they are already intrinsically trust each other for an alternative reason outside of business, right? Think about that. I go to Grace Church in Eden Prairie. Just a couple of people go there, like 8,000, right? Generally speaking, is there a trust amongst people in the men's Bible study on Friday morning? Yeah, probably a little bit of trust there, right? We disclose a lot of information personally about each other, so on and so forth. That becomes a network, right? The purpose is not to get business from them. It's to acknowledge that you have these networks in which you are, you guys are service oriented. So you're taking care of people and they're taking care of you. So they're attaching to that. And as a result, naturally, the business is going to come. You're trusting the other brothers and sisters who are firefighters with you, right? And they're trusting you. And when they say, I've got a need in real estate, it's going to be you, right? So that's good. Other networks? I mean, there's only two reasons that, or two things you kind of need to accomplish for a client to work with you, right? They need mm -hmm. to like you, trust you. Right. It's almost right. it. But yeah, sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Like and trust. Other groups that you guys are already connected to? I joined um, the Southwest Metro Chamber of Commerce. You did? Oh, cool. So you meet in Chan, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, we go every, uh, every other Tuesday, we go to different, like, business and like Tafonia, Carver, okay. Van Hassan, um, not even great because they're big. Um, Why'd you do that, Chris? Well, I so I I grew up in the area, and I feel like this is I mean obviously it's my home, but I want to like give back to the community that like raised me. So. Um, and when he's giving to the community, and people are watching that, don't you think there's going to be a natural effect where people are going to say, "Oh, this guy's giving up his own time volunteering." Not there to make money, volunteering, and that's what I was hoping for. I was hoping he didn't say, I knew there'd be a lot of connections in real estate, so I went there. You know, this business happens naturally if you do it according to what we've been talking about. If it's not about the money and we're thinking about our big whys, and you're focused on those big whys, whether it's the vacation coming up, it's your family, it's your personal growth in the future, whatever that big why is, we're doing this naturally. Right? Yeah, it shouldn't even feel like work, especially after your first couple of years, after you do have, you are established and things like, it doesn't feel like work anymore, like it's fun. So that's great that you say that because I want, I want to bring it to the next level is how do we make sure 
that we are, first of all, it's one thing to be in networks and to be in groups and stuff. To be a firefighter, you're already. How do we make sure that we are also maintaining good enough connections with these people in the network that they never forget that we can help them in real estate as well when the time comes, right? Isn't that that just that little piece that's always a little bit tricky? You know, you don't want to constantly be reminding them, you know, he's wearing a Keller Williams shirt every time he goes to a fire, right? We don't want that. <laughs> you know? I mean, it would be kind of cool. Idea. It would be kind of cool. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm just saying, you know, talk to us a little bit about how, how you guys actually do that. Right. And so I'd, do that? I'd say just being authentic and, and being present, like you were talking about. Naturally, people want to talk about real estate. And once they know you're in real estate, for some reason, that's something that sticks with them. Yeah. They want to ask about the market. They want to talk about it. Um, whether you're bringing it up, um, you know, kind of calmly or not obviously um, in conversation, but uh, whether you're coming from something or going somewhere and naturally questions kind of come from that. But a lot of it is asking questions about them, learning about them and ask them a question that maybe you want to be asked as well because most people are going to reciprocate the question. So ask them something you don't know about them. So I know this, um, what, what I'm thinking about now is that it sounds to me, and maybe I'm prejudging, but it sounds to me like they're talking about doing this in person. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Yes. Because the way he's speaking, it sounds like he's not on the phone calling people and talking, right? So that's the other piece of the puzzle. The critical component is you actually have to be there, right? You actually have to be there with them. That's one of the most common missing things when it comes to network is that people don't actually go and in, in, you know, engage in the network, engage with the people that you are connected to through these different groups. And that's where if you're intentional and Amy, you know, came to me last week and coached me and Dana coached me last week and said the same thing. You gotta have two coffee meetings, two personal meetings face to face every week. At least set a standard, set yourself a standard saying, I'm going to be engaged with my network in person two, three times a week. If that's going to help build your business from the ground up, because again, we're thinking about the big why, and we're thinking about what that's going to do for the development of our business, then we actually have to set goals on physically being there and doing it. Does that make sense? And do you guys do that intentionally and purposely do networking events, go to networking events, Staying involved in your groups and stuff. Most appreciation things. I mean, one thing that's really big is like we reward anyone who says whether they text us, call us, email us, just say it quickly in passing that they mentioned our name to somebody. We reward them with a thank you card or a little gift. We drop in the mail, regardless of if we ever hear from that person. We get a meeting set. We reward them just for saying thank you for thinking of us and sharing our name, kind of thing, regardless of what comes to it. I love it. And to follow up on that, yes, I'd say we do at least three times. Six people at that given time, whether it's a happy or a event or whatever else or someone else is hosting, yeah, from victory to honor. Great. I love it. And that will lead us, we'll conclude the meeting with on to needs. And one little note, obviously, it's a good um, way to connect to the upcoming events this afternoon um, at 4 o'clock in Mazetta. If you guys want to socialize a little bit more about networking. Surround yourself with people that you'd like to be around and you'd like to be with. Um, obviously, we're here together today for a reason. We can do that in other events as well. So I encourage you to do that. So Can I just say one thing? Please. I thought it was so cool what they were talking about, how um, you can you can be the, have the person for everyone. So if something breaks on their house, they think to call you to ask who to call. I think that's got to be a big thing because a lot of those questions come related to a house. And if you can have that person that's trusted and reliable that you've used before, I think that's a huge. Do you guys know all the answers when they call you? Not all. If we don't, we find them. Do you find them? Yes, yes, you do. That's all you do. You can find them. How many times? This is the other collaboration piece that I think we didn't touch on that is absolutely critical in this yeah, business. This How many times have I reached out to Tony, out to Scott, out to pretty much the whole office, or you guys just saying, hey, we need somebody who can weld a, you know, a fence on a listing. Well, I don't have a welder in our cache of resources. You know, somebody help out, right? right? You know, and it's not just the office. But this is, I mean, we've been selling houses for a long time in this office collectively. So the resources that are available are pretty extraordinary. And would it be better than someone, somebody who someone else trusted working with, right? 
until makes so it sometimes easier. when that happens, if someone asks for someone we don't have, we're texting other agents, but we're always we're also texting friends or past clients Absolutely. that we think would be great, and we're like, hey, we've got this client that needs trust. this exactly. And so all of a sudden, we had a reason to touch someone that we're helping someone else. So. You got a client who's got a landscaper who's consistently at their house every single week because it's a larger property. You need a landscaper, you're calling that client, also you made that connection. They're like, of course, the guy's great, you know, here's their contact. I love it. Very, very good. Thank you, guys. Let's go through some wants and needs, some stuff that's new, that's coming on, that uh, that we want to share, uh, whether buyers or sellers, it'd be great. I got a listing in Minnetonka, why is that a school? It's a three-bedroom, two-bath, stuck under um, in Ridgedale neighborhood, excuse me. Um, and uh, MLS price is 450. It's got a detached, it's got a two car garage, but a detached heated garage with a um, uh, office space or a studio on top. So looking for something. It's really cool. Now. So that two car, de <laughs> two car de detached garage is two two cars and go there plus the office space. Correct. And so then the, could, and then there's the attached garage. Then you could take that attached garage and convert it into living space, make the house bigger. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, bent houses. Yeah. Burn it. 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 Like in to a neighborhood, like I'm in Washington or Antonka or uh, Virginia or one of the little lakes, up to a million. Uh, otherwise, if it's not it's just in the lake area where they're going to be like trailering a boat, it'll be like up to seven. So it doesn't have to be recreational, yes. low boat. Okay, yep. so they want to yep. They want to be able to do it wake, wake surfing. Okay, that's so important. If they're going to have to trailer, then it's like up to seven in the area. Are they doing single family only or tell Single family you? only and like three bedrooms. Three bedroom single family, and then we have uh, listing coming listing in an area uh, Boulder Point. It's in uh, Mitchell Road in DC. Some of them are right around three thousand. So the townhomes in that area are like twenty nine to thirty two hundred square feet. You need like three bedrooms, and we've got one in there in six fifty. Great. Right. Barely in Long. Barely. Yeah. It's I mean, you yeah. Yeah. It's like it's caribou coffee. Behind yeah. like caribou. Yeah. Yes. yes. Exactly. So it's one of the ones that are directly facing the water. Three bed, three bath, three car garage, two story. 1.1. Dock. Dock. Yep. Oh, yes. yeah. It's, it's like a good one. Fast you one can it's the best one. Get a 26 foot or a 30 foot foot. Yeah, they used to the best thing. You want one of those? It's all on the market last year. It was a square foot, right? 27? Yeah, 2770, I think. Yeah, yeah, we sold, we sold that, that one. Did you sell that duplex? Uh, we've got we an offer. Yeah, there's like two offers right now. So, so it's bring offers. Not under contract. Yeah, please sell that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Thank you, Lydia. Wants and needs. Wants and needs. List. Yep. Thanks you guys so much for doing that, Brahma and Ben and Alex. Oh, I love yeah. you. Yeah. See you. Yeah. See you. Yeah. See you. Yeah. See you.